So we had a powerful start, and now I want to rewind a little bit and offer special thanks to the sponsors who made this whole event possible. Target, City, and the Ford Foundation. Thank you to all of you. To appreciate the kind of recommitment that we have to have, it's helpful to recall that all the living presidents called for what they called for 20 years ago in Philadelphia at the summit where America's Promise was born, as I mentioned earlier. The president's call was answered by a group of organizations that actually gave rise to America's Promise, our founding partners, the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, communities in schools, the Corporation for National and Community Service, Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, and the Points of Light, along with the United Way. So I want to offer a thanks to our founders for making all this happen 20 years ago and continuing to be our partners today. We've been listening to the voices of young people throughout the morning sometimes in song, sometimes in words. And we want to recognize a few more exceptional young leaders. Those of you who are here today, I know so many of you, are, are, are all familiar with AT&T's commitment to the social sector and to young people in, in particular. So it's especially fitting that AT&T is partnering with America's Promise to announce an, and award, a new award, um, called the People of Promise for young people who are leading the way in creating opportunity for other young people. So to do the honors, I want to bring out my friend and five young winners of the People of Promise, Nicole Anderson, the president of the AT&T Foundation. Come on out and bring out the winners. Thank you, John, and congratulations to General Powell, Mrs. Powell, and the staff and partners of America's Promise. AT&T is proud to stand here with you today. I'm here to introduce the next panel, who also happen to be the inaugural winners of the People of Promise Award that recognizes exceptional young adults in their 20s. Each awardee has persevered through life challenges, but what sets them apart are not those challenges or the fact that they were able to overcome them, but that they applied their experiences to provide hope for others. To recognize their efforts, AT&T will gift each honoree $20,000 so that they can continue and scale the important work they do. I'm inspired encouraged, and incredibly humbled by their stories of promise. The 2017 People of Promise honorees and our next panelist are Yasmin Arrington, inspired, <laughs> inspired to be an agent for change, Yasmin founded Scholar Chips in 2010 to provide high school graduates with incarcerated parents like her own father as she was growing up, mentoring, support, and funds to pursue higher education. Six Toe Cancel. So Six Toe grew up in foster care. After graduating college, he founded Think of Us, a web and mobile app that empowers youth to build their own personal advisory board to help them transition out of foster care and into the workforce or post-secondary education. <laughs> Next, we have Alejandro Gac Artigas. <laughs> Inspired to help reverse the summer slide, Alejandro founded the Springboard Collaborative, which works with urban school districts to run an intensive five-week summer reading program for kids and most impressive, where students gain an average of three months in reading proficiency. And then we have, <laughs> yeah. 
I kind of feel like I'm at the Oscars. This is fun. <laughs> then we have um, Cardine Lewis Allen. to combat the high levels of unemployment and lack of education of young people in his Brownsville neighborhood in Brooklyn. Quadine, there we go, the hometown. Quadine founded Made in Brownsville, a youth creative agency and innovation hub where mentors working in creative fields train young people ages 14 to 23, 24 through 12 week apprenticeships. And our final People of Promise awardee goes to Lawrence Law Loving. <laughs> so after college at Tulane, Law returned to where he grew up in Appalachian, East Tennessee, to work for Career Connect, which helps students who are not on track to go on to college get the mentoring and career exposure they need. He is currently working to expand Career Connect from one pilot to 13 counties in East Tennessee. Our panel will be moderated by Erin Morrison, a, seniors, a senior staff writer for the movement at Mike. He covers the intersection of race, justice, politics, diversity, and civil rights. Please stand and join me in congratulating and welcoming our moderator and panelists. Congratulations. All right. Well, they've certainly already congratulated you, but I want to say uh, congratulations to each of you for the incredible work that, that you're doing, and Thank you. let's, let's tell them about it. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what you all have uh, accomplished over the years. And let me start with you, Yasmin. Uh, affording the, all the costs associated with uh, going to college is, is too hard for too many young people. Um, it's undoubtedly harder for young people who have an incarcerated parent. So um, why is it important to target this demographic uh, and make sure that they have an, an equal opportunity to thrive? Thank you, Erin. Um, well, that's a part of my personal story. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., um, American. Uh, my, <laughs> uh, my father has been in and out of jail and prison my entire life, and I'm 24 now. Uh, and. As many of you know, there are, I mean, and this is an estimate, quite many more, there are over two million youth in the United States with an incarcerated parent. Um, and so a lot of these young people, I mean, it, it's hard enough um, being in certain communities and marginalized um, communities uh, with zoning laws and, and um, The students, the young people, um, particularly with incarcerated parents, I mean, the United States has the highest incarcer incarceration rate in the entire world. I mean, hello, <laughs> but we promote education, um, which, which is important. But there's this whole entire population that is missing parents in the home. Right. Um, th that's financial gap right there. It, it's it's an economic struggle constantly. I grew up in a single parent home. There's emotional struggles, um, questions like where are my parents? Do they love me? Right. So, I mean, it's absolutely critical to as you as you asked, Aaron, to target this demographic because we've got work to do. Um, <clears throat> It's still a very taboo issue uh, in, in this country. Many people don't talk about it, but most people know um, someone um, or, or have a family member who is, in fact, incarcerated. Can you quickly, though, talk about um, what way your organization helps to, to uh, Certainly. Those, those folks who are falling? Certainly, yes. Yeah. So scholarships, um, I started in 2010. At that time, I was a junior in high school. Um, and um, scholarships provides college scholarships, mentorship, and a support network for youth who have incarcerated parents uh, who are pursuing a college degree, uh, higher education, vocational training. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let's talk to Sixto. Um, you know, you uh, are someone I, I met years ago, and it's kind of actually amazing to see 
uh, the work that you've done since we, we met about five years ago. Um, you know, as a national advocate for foster youth and, and having experienced the foster care system yourself, uh, you know firsthand the importance of uh, responsible adults uh, being involved in young people's lives. Um, but how are young people today, I know young people that you work with, creating those networks uh, with, amongst themselves? Yeah, so when I look at what's happening with young people across the country, we are connecting more than ever online before. But yet, when I look at social services that's responsible for helping us in foster care to heal, develop, and then thrive, I just don't believe we've reached responsibility just quite yet. And let me explain. When I look at um, our systems, we have no real-time data to have any type of real-time action. So we don't even know what our cohort of young people that are currently in our care are experiencing. And so part of our work has been to, one, empower every young person to connect with um, a, a personal advisory board that's made up of staff in their program, that's made up of personal adults. So part of our work is figuring out how do we support the adults who are in young people's lives. And then this third part, which is uh, we're developing an AI system and artificial intelligence to understand that the strategy uh, 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 that can be taken by technology, so being able to take zip code data, understand what's the best job for this young person based on their budget, personality, and what they want to do. These are things that the AI and the technology can become an expert, but technology is not meant to replace humans. So it is our vision to be able to take all that information and then empower the support of adults that are in that young person's life to have some type of insight and expertise on how that adult can then coach them. Then then we take the data that is being produced and then saying to ourselves, what is going on in this system? So what do I do when I get data back that says, why, does it take, why is it taking twice as long for African American males uh, for their educational request to be fulfilled, right? So being able to understand on the uh, uh, real time what's going on in a county, in a foster care system in a county, and then converting that to go back and say, let's work through this. We know we all have our own stuff to work through. So we're going to come to the table to work through it, but we're going to work through it. Um, so, so, so for there's a us, lot of, there's a lot of work to do. Oh, you, you okay. can say that again. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's. Uh, we want to make sure we get everyone in here. So uh, let's talk to Alejandro. Um, Alejandro, um, you created a literacy program that helped thousands of elementary schoolers in Philadelphia, New York, D.C., and Oakland, California, which is my hometown, uh, learn how to read uh, on grade level by uh, fourth grade. So um, how were you able to garner the community support needed, the adult support needed to, to help that get off, off the ground? Yeah, totally. So in fourth grade, there's a, a fundamental shift. Uh, before then, children are primarily learning to read, and thereafter, children are reading to learn. Uh, if you haven't made that transition by fourth grade, you don't have the founda foundational skill set you need to be able to access the rest of your education. And once you fall behind, you stay behind. Uh, a kid who can't read proficiently by fourth grade is four times as likely to drop out of high school. And once you add poverty to the mix, they're 13 times as likely. Uh, that translates into hardship further down the road. Uh, nationally, our, our uh, of low-income fourth graders, only 17% are reading proficiently by fourth grade, and not coincidentally, only 9% earn a college degree. Uh, our national poverty rate of 15% is largely explained by our adult illiteracy rate of 14%. Uh, when I graduated from Harvard in 2009, I joined Teach for America, I moved to Philly to become a first grade teacher, and I was living with two high school science teachers, I had to share my first grade lesson plans uh, with my roommates because so many of their 11th graders still didn't know how to read. I grew up in a family that had escaped political persecution and immigrated to the US so that my sister and I could have access to better uh, educational opportunities. And growing up in a house without money but with lots of ambition taught me two things uh, that get at the, the community engagement piece. One is that a child's education involves a whole lot more than just their schooling. And the second is that parents' love for their children is the single greatest and most underutilized natural resource in education. Appreciate that. So I founded Springboard uh, to tackle America's literacy crisis at its root, uh, and our summer and after school interventions combine daily reading instruction for pre-K through third graders, weekly workshops training parents to teach reading at home, uh, and an incentive structure through which we award learning tools to families from books to tablets in proportion to their kids' reading progress. 
since launch five years ago now, we grew from 40 to 4,000 kids in Philly, the Bay, uh, DC, and, and launching this summer right here in New York. Uh, what's been exciting about that is that kids are doubling their annual reading progress. In schools that have fewer than 20% of parents show up to parent-teacher conferences, we consistently get 90% of families to show up to the weekly training workshop. And by training parents and teachers to work together, we put kids on a path that closes that gap by fourth grade uh, in a nation that, where you can correlate fourth grade reading scores with uh, building prisons, it matters a lot to them. Great. Uh, let's talk to our uh, hometown hero, uh, Cardine. Um, let's, let's talk about, um, around the idea that adults um, have the responsibility, responsibility of keeping uh, the American dream um, alive for young people. Um, you've talked about the, the importance of apprenticeships. Um, I want you to sort of call out a success story, particularly one out of uh, Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, um, which the media doesn't always portray in the you know, positive light. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, you know we, we need apprenticeship. We also need, like, uh, enablers, I think, for those. Uh, my earliest enablers were, you know, um, they're in the audience right now, my mother and my grandmother, um, who, who essentially uh, uh, never told me I couldn't do something. Right. Um, so, so, but but then there's a gap between like what they have, the resources that they enable, and then what I need to do to get to where I, I needed to go. Um, you know, so in order, you know, Brownsville, we have the highest concentration of public housing in the nation. We have, you know, the uh, highest uh, number of disconnected young people in Brooklyn, um, uh, and um, you don't overcome that without somebody helping you. Um, and um, you know, so when. You know, I didn't have somebody to tell me I needed to make a portfolio um, in order to get into the schools I wanted when I was applying for college. Um, that would have been really key to getting into that card at Cornell, right? Um, so w when when we're we're doing our work now, we need to be the people that we needed growing up. Um, and so one of our young people, uh, one day he he uh, he developed a portfolio because we gave him the tools in order to do that and taught him the technology um, in order to make his portfolio and um, encouraged him to go to a, a por portfolio development class at Pratt and he got into that and then we helped him to apply for Col Columbia and and a new school and he got into there um, right. this past this past month so we we have to be those linkages when they're missing. so that you're already seeing some su success out of out of uh, the program that you've yeah. started okay I know we're uh, short on time here so we're going to talk uh, to law I, I this this question that we talked about it before I think a, a lot of people have a perception of uh, East Tennessee and, and Appalachian uh, communities as being so monolithic uh, and, and uh, not really thinking outside of the box or having a broad understanding of ways to thrive, but you're really working to expand the pathways that people take, not only to education, but to, to the workforce. Can you talk uh, some about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so where I grew up and, and where I live and work now in, in Northeast Tennessee, uh, the economy for a long time was based around tobacco farming and low-skilled manufacturing. And neither of those are, are thriving industries. So if you're a young person and your window on the world is what your parents or your grandparents uh, or, or relatives may have done, and you see those things going away, it's hard to have a lot of hope for what, what you can do after, after high school. Uh, so what we're working on with Career Connect is starting those conversations with those students early, uh, allowing them to, to think about what it is they might want to do. No, you're probably not going to make a successful go of it as a tobacco farmer, but there's all, all sorts of great careers right in your own backyard in things like healthcare and advanced manufacturing. And, and so then we, we sit down with them and, and get them thinking about those things. Uh, we, we help them think about what the educational paths to, to those careers are. Uh, and then we partner them with our local industry sponsors and, and partners so that they get the chance to do things like facility tours and job shadowing and even internships. Uh, so they get a real hands-on feel for what it might be to do something that they, they never thought would be possible uh, you know, or, earlier in, in their, uh, their academic careers. Uh, it, it has uh, really shown and proven to be a, a positive model for what would otherwise be a, a, a difficult rural area to work in, and, and we're hopeful that it's a model that can spread to other rural areas as well. Great. Well, let's congratulate all of the uh, people of Promise Honorees again. Thank you very much.